Welcome to another episode of The Edge presented by The Bluntness. I'm your host, Gregory Fry, executive editor over at thebluntness.com. And today we have an awesome guest, Oswaldo Graziani. Welcome. Oz, Thank you. You have quite a background. Could, could you <laughs> introduce yourself for our audience? Well, yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation first, Gregory. I'm excited to be here. As you mentioned, my name is Osvaldo. They call me Oz. And I'm the creative director uh, for Fluent Cannabis. That is um, MSO in the United States. And we're heavily focused on Florida. That's like our, our biggest state and our biggest market. But we also have operations in Pennsylvania, uh, licenses in Texas, and in Michigan. So we're definitely very into the cannabis industry. And, you know, uh, I'm excited to be here to talk about it. Nice. And before we go any further, I forgot my headphones. Are you getting any echo on your end? Or are you good? I'm good. I have, I'm listening all well. Okay. 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 Well, look, I know we're both firm believers that cannabis is medicine and it's so important. And I, building on that, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what brought you into this industry, why you're here, what's driving you. Oh, amazing. That's a great question. And, and one thing that everybody in this industry, almost, almost everybody has a beautiful story in, because this is fairly new for a lot of people. So for me, it had to do with two main things. Uh, first of all, I started as a consumer. I love the product way before I even thought about the idea of getting into this business. I never thought that would be a case. Uh, then um, when I saw the industry like actually getting into, you know, a reality in the United States, I saw a window for a person like me who is a creative developer, a branding person, a person that worked his career in television and, and the digital industry to create audiences to, to really, you know, put a little bit of that into the industry. I was seeing all the opportunities of our industry was just starting and that everything was, you know, a challenge, but in, in a way, a vast wide canvas of opportunities for people like us that are creative developers. So um, in 2017, I believe uh, I was working, I had my, I had my production company doing content uh, for TV industry, cable industry, uh, digital outlets. And they called me to do a documentary, a develop a documentary on the cannabis industry in Florida. And I was extremely excited about it. Even though um, documentaries wasn't kind of my comfort zone, I did it in the past and it was like, yeah, I'm very interested in the subject. And that's how I got into understanding what was really going on in Florida. I, you know, I live in Miami and I didn't really knew how the industry was starting to, to develop. So, you know, that I, that led me to get into you know a documentary is a perfect way to deep dive into a subject and know it perfectly and that got me you know really excited about it and uh, uh, I ended up working for the company I was you know doing the documentary for and that was a kind of really interesting and exciting transition from developing content to de developing cannabis brands and cannabis dispensaries and building basically a brand from scratch. So that's kind of the whole process that I got me here. I actually turned in four years right now in this company. So, it's, you know, in, in, in cannabis years, that's a lot. It's like dog years. That's, that's a joke of what works yeah. in this industry. Yeah. I know the feeling. Yeah, absolutely. It is, and it is incredible. You you, you mentioned the transition, you know, from your previous career to cannabis. And I wonder if there's anything to be said about the skills that you've brought in from an outside industry, you know, the creative, the, the, the storytelling, um, the production content, all that. Any thoughts? Absolutely. And, and to be honest, I built my whole 
approach to the industry inspired on my past. And, and it's almost like I had no choice. That, that was my skill set. Uh, so as I mentioned, I work a lot on the TV industry, developing content and TV shows and, and on-air promotions. And then I jumped into original production. And then, of course, as the industry transitioned to digital, I did it as well. I started working for Google and YouTube. So when I peek at the industry and the cannabis industry, I, I, I look at an industry that was very early stages on branding and personality. And, you know, been four years, so it has evolved a lot, especially in the West Coast. But it's still, they it still feel that this commodity type of product, like you just sell it by volume, like it was a gas station. And, and I thought a, a, a lot of my skills at building brands and, and, build, and finding niches to create like a specific products for them was a huge opportunity for, for the industry. So I started applying all that, you know, all that, that approach of really focusing and building a brand that doesn't necessarily tell you right away, I'm cannabis. I, and one thing that I noticed doing my research is that there was this kind of obsession for the cannabis culture and the cannabis plant and kind of all the, 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 the let's call it the first wave of cannabis branding that is kind of this old school approach that is completely important and, and necessary, but it, it does, didn't necessarily show the full picture of the cannabis consumer nowadays. So my mission with Fluent was uh, to create a brand, prepare for the future that was able to embrace all this type of different demographics that were jumping in into the industry. So all my learning, so how to create that, create content for the different demographics have helped me to create brands and products and content because there's a lot of, you mentioned narrative storytelling. Uh, I think, you know, that, that played a big role uh, to get things going, you know. And let's, I'm really curious to, to learn more about your role at Fluent today. And I wonder what you can share about your current uh, focuses, initiatives, opportunities, challenges. How's it going on your end with the, the creative marketing role? Well, you know, the, a new industry brings a lot of challenges. But again, those challenges are also opportunities. So one of the biggest challenges for uh, me as a marketing person was understanding that I was going to play with a completely different and honestly unfair uh, kind of set of rules. And that, you know, applies to a lot of things. Uh, you know, digital marketing is a good example. You know, in my past, I was doing a lot of, you know, I was putting a lot of money, a lot of investment in social media and in growth and, and just, you know, understanding that social media is essential part of your business model if you want to develop brands. Um, so uh, we even, you know, I had a path in my past. I were also consulting for politicians and doing stuff on the politics realm that wasn't necessarily nice, uh, but social media was completely OK with that. And we invested a lot of money. On, on that as well. Then I jumped to cannabis and I basically felt that I lost all my superpowers, you know, that, that, that all the things I did to build audiences and to create connections were completely gone. And we were fighting this battle of shadow banning, censorship, and basically uh, a, a huge gray area of not understanding where the rules are and just Trying to so that's been a big challenge, and honestly, I, again, we see it as an opportunity because it, we know it will change. We know we're part of this huge transition uh, where cannabis is becoming normal, and it will take a while, but it, we're moving in the right direction. So, in, in that sense, you know, that's a perfect example of a huge challenge as a marketing person and how we have to be creative and strategic to pivot to other ways to connecting with consumers. So in the cannabis industry, for example, we discovered very early that we had to go back to uh, the basics, you know, like email, uh, texting, all those things that were kind of left behind by other industries. We pick up on those just because we were going to be able to connect directly with 
patients and consumers in a way that will appreciate that, you know, non uh, middleman filtering. Uh, having said that, it's still, you know, complicated. Uh, you have, I think one thing that I will recommend all the time is whenever you reach out to, uh, you know, uh, companies, digital companies, marketing companies, uh, technology companies, you need to ask if they are cannabis friendly because they won't, they will get your business until they know you're sending emails about cannabis and then they cancel your account. So it's always good to, you know, ask first. And, and we had that experience with email marketing, with text marketing, all those stuff. And there's plenty of cannabis friendly companies out there, but the majority are still not embracing cannabis. So that, that's a huge challenge for us. When you think about it, that, that normalization of cannabis doesn't really happen without the storytelling, without the marketing. I don't know how much no. of a focus that is for your average cannabis operation. It's more of a bigger picture thought, I guess. I don't, and, and maybe you know, I think it leads to my next question. You know, you, you've talked about this before as well, how the creative and marketing side of cannabis is very, it's a very inspiring place to work because there's, it's so new. There's so much opportunity. Yeah. And I wonder if you could further unpack that, um, you know, for any other creative marketing professionals watching this, what is it about the opportunity that makes it so inspiring? Yeah. Let me put you a perfect example. Um, and that is basically the narrative of, of what I built for Fluent. When I jumped to Fluent in 2017, this company was called, and the brand was called Knox Medical. And you saw the branding, and it was basically doctors in gowns and, and just like measuring labs. And, and it was such, this kind of illusion of a medical or pharmaceutical company doing cannabis. And it kind of makes sense in 2016 uh, when, when they got their license and, and in Florida where it's strictly medical and you see the rules, you understand that was what the state wanted to do. Uh, but then that's where marketing comes and, you know, and understands like, okay, this is where we are right now, but let's look at where this is going. And then you understand that, yeah, this is medical, but it's slowly going to become adult use. I don't even like to, to use the word recreational. I think there's a lot of uses for cannabis that are not medical and are not necessarily recreational, uh, but they are adult use. Um, and, and when you see that, you understand, okay, we need to understand that uh, there are some rules, but we need to build a brand for the future. So my first mission was let's create a brand for real and not just a brand that complies with the, what the cannabis industry is on that specific gear. Um, so for a marketing person, a branding person, as I mentioned before, it is kind of a white canvas. If you jump into the, the cannabis industry, there's huge demand for branding, creation, narrative, uh, building brands, basically, because we're coming and I use this analogy. I actually did a presentation about it a few months ago, where I, I mentioned that the cannabis industry is migrating from a model of the gas industry or the oil companies. Like, you know, if you go to a gas station, you don't have any loyalty for any brand or the other. Your loyalty is location and pricing, right? It's, it's a commodity, right? So the industry started there. You know, you, you, you didn't, people weren't that sophisticated deciding what to choose or not in the cannabis industry. But it has evolved so fast that now it's becoming more like the car, the auto industry, where you have different ranges of prices, uh, you know, needs, uh, colors, uh, you know, and, and it became all this where uh, effort where actually branding, positioning, uh, finding your market becomes a thing. So for anybody that is, you know, like me, a creative developer, somebody that's obsessed with branding, packaging, messaging, it is a huge opportunity. And this is happening where there's a lot of reports right now of how the industry is growing. It's actually quadrupled in the last, I don't know, like two years. 
uh, there's a, there's going to be a huge demand for that in, in the industry. I see it on my team. My team started to be me and another person four years ago, and now we're more than 10 and, and just a marketing department doing marketing stuff. So that's a big change. And, 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 and that's where I see the, the biggest opportunities for marketing people. When you go to other industries, you kind of feel that a lot of things are basically done and you're repeating formulas and you're not like there's not many uh, for a creative developer. Again, uh, not many uh, creative challenges and in this industry. Oh, there's, there's even sometimes I'll say there's more than I uh, asked for, for sure. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. On the branding side, what do you think really distinguishes in cannabis a great brand from all the rest? And, and where do you see the struggling brands missing the mark? Well, uh, I'm going to give you a boring question, but I learned that is completely true. And you notice it in the cannabis industry happens a lot. It's all about a good brand only can survive with inventory and, and consistency on their product quality and availability. So you see all these brands that are amazing. And then you go to California looking around for them and it's almost like a quest. Like it's impossible to find them. They're sold out. They, they, they're really doing a better job showing that the brand exists and actually making the product. So the biggest challenges, and I think the successful companies, no, I'm not saying brands, the successful companies in the industry are the ones that are solving production and inventory first and using that as their platform to build brands. If you do it the other way around, uh, you're gonna fail. You, people really are looking for uh, product. You know, at the end of it, the, 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 the most important thing, that, and I will say that the, the, the main actor in this industry is the product. You know, you know the experience is the product. So um, in, in that sense, it's all about having product and, you know, trying, to build a brand around that. And, and I've seen it here in Florida, I've seen it in California, how amazing brands in the sense of design, you know, storytelling presentation, just fail miserably because they cannot deliver the promise on inventory. And the other way around, I've seen other companies that are so good at delivering inventory that they still are not taking branding seriously because it's kind of an easy business when you just have the product and the inventory. So that's also, a, you know, that is maybe it's not a problem today, but those brands are going to struggle to to find identity later on if they don't start building on that right now. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And what about the marketing side? Uh, you know, you gave some details on this uh, a minute ago, you know, comparing it to the automobile industry. And I wonder if there's anywhere else you see cannabis businesses struggling with their marketing. Um, and, and where do you suggest cannabis operations put their marketing focus? One, of course, once they have production and, and branding dialed in. Exactly. Assuming that that is already uh, a fact that they have production sold, I think it's all about, um, you know, retention, to be honest. We've been talking about it internally so much. Uh, when you have the product quality and, and good pricing, they, you know, they will come. You know, the, the community is very good on finding their places on social media, and, you know, Weed Maps and Leafly. Uh, so that fair visit is incredibly important. But it's a second visit when you actually have them come the second time where you actually f say, OK, here's our relationship. Let, let me build on this. So we're focusing heavily on on building a, a, a loyalty um, a ecosystem with a loyalty program, customer service, product availability. So many, many things. But retention is definitely part of, 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 of what we think is, you know, one of the most important things uh, when you have already things going on. And I think a lot of companies fail, fail on that because it 
people get sometimes extremely excited about acquisition, which is you know important. They need to come the first time in order to come the second time. But the market, at least in Florida and Pennsylvania as well, that we are working heavily on that market, the market is very, uh, let's say, uh, they, they don't give you loyalty right away. And it's all about uh, companies fighting for that first customers with incredible deals, 50% giveaways. So you actually rather assume, let them chop around and then I'll have a strategy to come to me because it's gonna be impossible to guarantee like day one loyalty. So that's one of the biggest challenges right now. Uh, the other one I think is not necessarily beyond our control, but definitely extremely complicated is the fact that uh, every state is not a, necessarily a different state, it's a different planet. And the rules on the way they operate and the way that the cannabis uh, uh, regulations are set. So you have all these incredible, even um, contradictory uh, uh, rules. And so you have to basically set up your brain to every market you're playing in and are completely different. So that brings for marketing uh, teams and everybody, production teams, you know, a retail, a set of challenges that other industries simply don't have, you know, like when you're selling uh, Coca-Cola or whatever, like, you know, it's basically kind of the same rules in every, in every state you work on. So for us, it's not like that and makes it incredibly um, difficult uh, to operate. Uh, but, you know, it's part of the reality of the industry right now. It will probably change. But it, it needs to come, you know, from the basically from the top, at least some type of decriminalization from the federal government that can allow moving around state lines, you know, banking, all this basic stuff that every other industry takes for granted. Sure. And, you know, I, diving deeper into the, the marketing side of things, um, demographics you know one of the biggest opportunities with cannabis is that it's potentially relevant to everybody because we all have endocannabinoid systems and it's also a huge challenge um you know so many different potential demographics and, and, and there's this iceberg below the waterline all the people who are not cannabis consumers right now that's a, like the majority of people it's insane and i so I think there's a lot of factors there around demographic. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on the demographic focus for cannabis brands, um, any best practices you're seeing or any pitfalls you're seeing, uh, any thoughts at all around the demographics of it all? Absolutely. It's a beautiful subject, I think. Um, first of all, because, you know, as I mentioned before, the demographics of the cannabis consumer have expanded incredibly in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, you see a picture of, of, if you think of a cannabis consumer in the 60s, 70s, it's basically Chichen Chong, you know, like Bob Marley. Like they have all this kind of culture, subculture elements that were incredibly important to embrace cannabis and take it to where we are now. But if you see a picture of a cannabis consumer right now, it's incredibly diverse. And not only on 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 gender and 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 uh, you know identity in everything in 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 age in in reasons why you know from you mentioned at the beginning cannabis is medicine and that's definitely a very important part but it's much more than that it's culture it, it is you know relationships it, it is uh, adult use of recreational and and a way for us at Fluent to kind of put it that together is empowerment. Cannabis just is a tool that can make you a better version of yourself. So basically that applies to whatever you want to be. If you are a person that, that have chronic pain, cannabis is going to make you a better version of yourself just because it's going to help you with that issue. But if you have anxiety issues or uh, insomnia, that's going to help you. If you're a creative person and you need some inspiration, that's probably going to help you as well. So it's definitely depending on what you want. So that talks to all demographic. It, it expands the pool so incredibly. Uh, so that's where branding becomes important because you need to start talking 
one thing that we discuss all the time, you know, that shows about the, the women in cannabis is, you know, they're incredibly engaged. They're becoming, they're consuming cannabis more and more, uh, jumping into the industry. It is just a, a huge demographic. But when, when you go and see branding for women in cannabis, you start to see more and more, but it's definitely not balanced yet. It's not even close. So there's a huge gap there. Uh, you see senior citizens, we see that here in Florida. They are embracing cannabis for the right reasons, for in, in incredible numbers are incredible. And their stories are absolutely awesome. So there's very little brands and companies thinking about that. They're, they're trying to cover the whole culture thing. Uh, so, and of course, culture, you know, the cookies, the jungle boys, that is, you know, that's, you know, that the the main engine right now of the industry so that is incredibly important as well so it will become on how the rules are regulated uh, set up uh so you so companies decide how they want to tackle branding for if you're a brand in colorado in california it's probably going to be more uh, easier for you to 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 set up on a niche and say okay i'm going to tackle women with my brand and build my company around this uh but in florida we are vertically integrated. You know, we have to grow, process, manufacture, cultivate, package everything ourselves at Fluent. So we are an operation of 400 and plus employees between retail, cultivation, marketing, corporate, everything else. So we're, when you're that big, just by design of regulations, you cannot afford tackling a niche. You have to go big. You have to to think about everybody. So the way we're doing it at Fluent is creating brands for all these demographics that we think are incredibly valuable. You know, from heavy users to flower, classic flower users, to value consumers that are looking more for volume than for quality, where, you know, uh, people are looking for concentrates, edibles, and then, you know, gender-based marketing, you know, there's a lot there. Uh, so it's definitely depending, going back to your original question, it will definitely depend on how you know you the size of your license basically i like that creating creating different brands under fluent to target various demographics it seems apropos to the name fluent yeah and that was the whole idea yeah, it, fluent is diverse and 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 is basically you know there's even a lot of, to be honest, there's a lot of friction between these demographics. You know, the culture group, uh, you know, the cannabis originals, let's call it that way. They're heavy users. They are love flower. They are very important on the market. And they're not necessarily, all of them are happy about the industry going mainstream. You know, everybody wants to protect their, you know, the kind of the, the uh, I don't know, like the, the origins of, of things. Uh, I see it completely different. I actually think cannabis, everybody that serves cannabis uh, or the opportunity to, to try cannabis. So I, I, I'm, I'm completely in the team of cannabis is diverse and there's you know, plenty of brands and products for everybody and not just the culture uh, or, or the subculture that, that brought cannabis to where it is right now. You know, another piece of the puzzle here is advertising, which I think is a huge challenge. We were talking about some of the restrictions with social media. And in general, you know, people are are kind of uh, like to avoid conventional ads, like nobody wants an ad in their face. And mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on the current advertising landscape in, in cannabis and any ideas or, around the advertising in general for, for operators. Yeah, it is incredible. I have a lot of stories to share about that. I honestly think that the industry in most cases uh, is very early. So you need to really solve your production before you get it. It's almost like you need to earn uh, doing advertising. Uh, so a lot of companies are not there. And the companies that are, are there and they have actually a big and deep budget to do advertising, they're going to face a lot of challenges on, on not necessarily the government or the regulations. It's more the media outlets themselves having rules about cannabis advertising or not. And it's incredible how you can find 
all these companies that should be taking cannabis money because I, I don't believe they're in a good economic situation, they're still not. So I have a good example. It's an interesting story. Um, when we started Knox, um, uh, you know, four years ago, and I started working at Knox, uh, that later became Fluent, uh, one of the things I wanted to do, just like a statement, was have our first, the first cannabis ad in the Miami Herald. You know, it's the most important newspaper in Florida, uh, very high, very good reputation. And I saw already like Leafly did something with the New York Times. And I wanted to do our local approach to that. So we reach out to them and they say no. They basically said, I'm sorry, we're not doing cannabis. We're not allowed, blah, blah, blah. Internally, we cannot. And they apologized. They were extremely nice about it. And we said, okay, we tried, you know, you know, no biggie. We, you know, we kept thinking about other stuff. And then, I don't know, like six months later, they called back and they were like, you know what? We, we, we want to do it, you know, and they changed their mind. And, in a, you know, probably they were looking at their books and how print media is struggling. But, uh, but it shows you a little bit how the, the trend is changing and people are starting to, and now the Miami Herald, we, at the end of it, we did the first ad, a full page ad on the Miami Herald for Knox Medical. And I was extremely proud about it. Uh, and now they have a weekly column about cannabis, you know, so things change. So you just have to be patient and understand that you have to knock the door. Same thing with the ad you're seeing in the back right now, this Rethink Cannabis. This was the first ad, cannabis ad, done in a, a, an Ocean Drive magazine that is extremely popular, like lifestyle magazine here in Florida and the United States. And, and it was also an incredible story of a company deciding, okay, we want to start talking to our audience that is not pro-cannabis. It's more, you know, partying and having fun and stylish and stuff like that. Uh, we want to embrace cannabis. So we created an ad for them. We, instead of just putting our brand out there in a, in a page, we, we, we thought, you know what, this, you know, these people are more the martini people or the cosmopolitans or, you know, having drinks. Let's do something to speak to them that they need to rethink cannabis. And, and it was incredibly popular. Uh, we got a lot of people, you know, talking about it. It got a lot of traction just because it was the first ad. So uh, having said that, there's a lot of also money to be wasted on advertising, to, to be honest. You really need to cover uh, your, your fundamentals first, have an um, amazing website, uh, develop a strong e-commerce uh, um, solution for customers to to purchase online uh, and have all these things that almost give you the right to go out and, and spend some ad money. So, so that's my way of seeing it. It's like we're not still, uh, at least in Florida, uh, I see companies like Cookies and, and, and others in other states heavily investing in marketing, and, but they have earned that. You know, they have earned that and, they're, and, and they, they are in that position right now. Uh, but most of other companies, it's more like I always say that is the the worst marketing you can do is great marketing in a product you don't have on your shelves. So so you know that's always my thing. It's like let's make sure we have the products there, and we can go crazy with the marketing part later. Yeah, let's not put the cart before the horse. Exactly. Exactly. Oz, you've been so generous with your time and your insights. And I wonder if there's anything else you'd like to add before we wrap this up. No, I think that, you know, love having these conversations. I think your questions were amazing. Uh, I probably you saw by my excitement giving your answers. And that's it. I invite everybody to visit our website, getfluent.com. And there you find all about our brands and what we do and, and and you know, uh, our, 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 we're extremely proud of the product we have and the brand we created. So um, all feedback will be embraced. Excellent, thank you. And that wraps another episode of The Edge. Thank you to our wonderful guest, Oswaldo Graziani. And thank you, dear audience. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a like and share with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe. And you can find much more over at, at thebluntness.com. Peace.